Grace and peace to you and welcome to worship here at Trinity Presbyterian Church, wherever you may be, whether you're watching online or listening in on the radio. And if you're catching us on Sunday, I want to say a very happy Mother's Day to all our moms. We celebrate you and honor you. We thank God for all that you mean to your children, and we hope that you know the love and care of your family this day. And now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we seek to encounter the living God. The book of Lamentations was written in a time of exile for God's people. Yet even in exile, there was faith in God's mercy and love. So hear these words from Lamentations 3 as we center our hearts and minds to worship God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in God. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, for the soul that seeks him. We often affirm with our words that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Yet still we go about harming others, living selfishly, and acting if the, as if the world centers around me alone. So let us turn toward God and away from those sins, confessing our brokenness together. Living God, we put our trust in you. We seek to worship you week after week, yet we fail to embrace the cost of discipleship. We act as if your grace is a cheap grace. Our words have been the tools of violence. Our actions have been means of division. 
Forgive us, O Lord, as individuals and as a community. Shape us into the faithful followers of your way, believers in your truth and sharers of the life you offer. Guide us in word and deed this day and every day. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. God offers us life and flourishing in the way of Jesus. God offers forgiveness and mercy and acts upon it when we turn toward the Lord. Having sought God's mercy, know you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Good morning. Do you remember a few weeks ago when it was Palm Sunday and we learned about Jesus riding a donkey into Jerusalem for the Passover festival? Well, that night, he and his disciples got together to eat supper. As they were eating, Jesus began to talk to his friends to try to prepare them for all the things that were going to be happening in the next few days. Jesus knew that his friends were going to be sad and worried and afraid. We all feel that way sometimes. And it's okay to be sad or worried or afraid or confused. But if you feel that way, it can help to stop and remember something Jesus told the disciples that night after supper. He said, Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God and also believe in me. You see, Jesus wanted us to realize and remember that God cares for us. He has a plan for our lives and God is always with us. After worship today, talk to your parents about times when they have been sad or afraid and confused and how believing in God helps make them feel better. And then share with them some things that make you sad and worried or confused. And remember, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Friends, as we prepare to hear God's word read and proclaimed, let us pray. God, our way and our path, let your word be for us a lamp unto our feet, a light to guide us when we seek it and hear it. May the words we share and the thoughts that we think be acceptable and holy in your sight. O oh God, our refuge and strength. Amen. Our first scripture, this le lesson this morning, comes from Psalm 37, verses 1 through 11. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord. And God will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the night and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Yet a little while and the wicked will be no more, though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
And our second reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, and beginning at verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Some of you will be familiar with the Alpha course. We did that here a number of years ago, or perhaps you did it at another church. Alpha is an introduction to Christianity, and it's offered in such a way that someone with no faith background can fully participate, while at the same time, there are plenty of insights for those who've been in church their whole lives. Alpha has been incredibly effective over the years in helping people come to know Jesus. The reason I mention all this is because I love the title to the first lesson. The first talk is Christianity, Boring, Untrue, and Irrelevant. You see, these were the three objections that Nikki Gumbel, the author of the Alpha Course, had growing up as an atheist. He simply didn't believe in the existence of God, but not only did he think Christian belief was untrue, he also thought it was irrelevant. He didn't see how something that happened 2,000 years ago in another part of the world had anything to do with his life today. And then third, he found the Christian faith just plain boring. His impression of the church's teaching was that it was all dull drudgery. When you look at the statistics, you have to conclude there are probably lots of people who agree with Nikki Gumbel's assessment of faith. Membership in many churches has fallen sharply over the decades. In just the last 10 years, the number of Americans who identify themselves as Christian has declined by 12%. Meanwhile, the religiously unaffiliated, those who describe themselves as atheists, agnostics, or nothing in particular, has gone from 17% of the population to 26%. So maybe Nikki Gumbel is right. Maybe Christianity doesn't have anything to offer people. Maybe it is boring, untrue, and irrelevant. In the face of these objections, Jesus made this astounding claim. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That expression, the way, the truth, and the life, was commonly used by religious teachers in Jesus' day to describe Torah, the law. It meant that the law provided a person with everything that they needed to know about life, about God, and about eternity. So Jesus intentionally used these three words to emphasize the sweeping scope of the claim that he was making. Jesus is saying, I am the one who gives meaning to everything. Jesus began by saying, I am the way. Now the claim here is, I am relevant to your life. What I have done matters to you. My life, death, and resurrection makes a difference in your everyday existence. Christ is claiming to be the way for a lost and hurting world. He is inviting us to follow him. Now, the truth is that everybody follows 
somebody. We talked about this a few weeks ago. All of us make decisions about what's important, about how we're going to treat others, about how we're going to invest our time and energy. We're all living in a certain kind of way, and these decisions come from what we believe. When it comes to faith, everybody has it. The idea that some people have faith and others don't is a popular one, but the reality is that everybody follows somebody or something. When Jesus says, I am the way, he is making a pretty outrageous statement. We're not being invited to follow a particular philosophy or some set of moral principles, but a person. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is saying you can't get to God by any other means. All other paths fall short. You can't get there by being good. You can't get there by being sincere. You can't get there by knowledge or upbringing. You can't even get there by being religious. There is no other way than through Christ. Now, in the minds of many that will be intolerant and somewhat narrow-minded, what about the person who has never heard the name Jesus? What about someone who's never had the opportunity to consider the Christian faith? Well, some respected Christian thinkers, people like C.S. Lewis and Billy Graham, have suggested that a person might be saved through Christ even if they have never heard heard of Jesus. It may be possible for a person who has not heard or properly understood the Christian message to turn to God in genuine repentance and to be saved through the work of Christ, even though they're not able to profess faith in him. Now, whatever you think of that idea, we need to remind ourselves that God is more merciful and more just than we could ever be. I think we need to allow for the fact that God may have made provision for people that we're not aware of. We also need to acknowledge that none of us knows the condition of a person's heart toward God. None of us can make pronouncements about a person's eternal destiny. And so we shouldn't presume to speak for God on things that God has not revealed to us. But what God has revealed, we ought to claim with conviction. And what God has revealed is that there is a way to eternal life. It doesn't matter what you've done, what religion you were born into, who you are, that way is through Christ. We are invited to accept him as Savior and follow him as Lord. Jesus also said, I am the truth. Now, some would say there's no such thing as absolute truth. Um, Who is to say that your truth is better than my truth? One common response to Christianity is, it may be great for you, it's just not for me. But I would argue this is not a logical Position. Again, I'll refer to C.S. Lewis. He pointed out a long time ago that if Christianity is true, it's of vital importance to everyone. And if it's not true, Christians are deluded and it's not good for us or anyone else. In fact, it's sad. And the sooner things are put right, the better. So is there any evidence to support the claim that Jesus is the truth. Well, that's something you'll need to decide for yourself, but consider that he spoke the most profound words that the world has ever heard. His teachings, like the Sermon on the Mount, and his parables, like the prodigal son and the good Samaritan, are without parallel. And not only that, he lived the most remarkable and influential life in human history. He healed diseases. He commanded the forces of nature. He raised people from the dead. He even conquered death himself. And then Jesus sparked the most transformative movement that has ever spread. 
So there is something about the words that Jesus spoke and the life that he lived that connects us to how things truly are at the deepest levels of existence. I believe Jesus is who he says he is. I believe Jesus is the truth. But here's the problem. It seems to me that when the church tries to speak truth, it often comes out as judgmental, negative, critical, and condemning. Bono, the lead singer of U2, is also a professing Christian, and he was once quoted in a magazine saying, Christians are hard to tolerate. I don't know how Jesus does it. And this is unfortunate. We're supposed to be the ones living with joy and hope and humility. We're the ones who are supposed to be an encouragement to the people around us. But all too often, Christians come across as arrogant and smug and self-righteous. I think one of the problems is that the church is often known more for what it stands against than what it stands for. Thankfully, it seems like that's beginning to change, but I would love to see the church of Jesus Christ put forth greater effort in showing the world what it stands for. You see, the truth of Jesus ought to mean something for the way that we live our lives. I believe that you and I can be the kind of people about whom other folks would say, You know, I don't believe what he believes. I don't think about God the way he does. But I shudder to think what would happen in our organization or in our neighborhood or in our community if he weren't around. We can be the kind of people about whom someone at work or someone at school might say she adds so much value, so much compassion, so much joy, so much life to this place. I may not agree with her faith. I might, might not believe in her God. But I know this place would be so much less if she weren't around. You see, you bear witness to the truth of Christ as you live each day with passion and purpose. And then finally, Jesus said, I am the life. Jesus comes offering us a better way to live. We are all fallen and the image of God in us is tarnished, but Jesus has removed that sin and granted us new life. So instead of living with guilt, addiction, and fear, Jesus offers us freedom and joy and contentment. You know, Jesus never promised us an easy life, but he did come to bring a full life. In fact, God takes great pleasure in us living the lives that we were meant to live. God even commands it. The psalmist writes, take delight in the Lord. That's kind of an odd command, isn't it? It's like, be happy or else. But God is really serious about this. God is not some cosmic killjoy. God is not trying to keep you from doing what you really want to do. God is not calling you to live a dull, boring, colorless life. What God offers is life in all of its abundance. And not only do we experience that kind of life here, but we have the assurance that it will never end. You know, some people will say, I'm perfectly happy without God in my life. I don't really need God. I'm not in the seeking mode. No, thank you. The problem is that we were created to live in relationship with God. And we may not even be aware of it, but without that connection, there will always be that hunger. There will always be that emptiness, always be that sense that something is missing. But when we encounter God, we begin to see why it is we were made in the first place. And once we see, we can't unsee. Once we've experienced God, we can't go back to what we had. Once we start to learn what life is really all about, it wouldn't make any sense to return to the way things were. So will you follow this Jesus who has come to give you life? You know, that phrase, to follow Jesus, gets used a lot in the church. And so as we close, let's consider for just a moment what it actually means. 
I believe that following Jesus means to orient our thinking and our living in a particular kind of way, the kind of way that Jesus taught is possible. And I'm convinced that's the best way to live. And you can decide whether or not you agree with that. I am convinced that forgiving others instead of carrying around resentment and bitterness is just a better way to live. I'm convinced that showing generosity instead of being selfish and greedy is just a better way to live. I'm convinced that having compassion for those in need instead of feeling indifference is a better way to live. I am convinced that pursuing peace instead of nursing grudges is just a better way to live. I'm convinced that having relationships that are characterized by honesty and integrity instead of deceit is frankly just a better way to live. The bottom line is that Jesus brings us a life that really is life. Friends, Christianity isn't boring. It's what gives life meaning and texture and substance. It's not untrue. It is the truth, and it's of infinite importance, and it's not irrelevant. In fact, it touches every aspect of our existence. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if you will allow it, that reality will transform us from the inside out. Amen. Let us join our voices with Christians who have gone before us and with those who will follow us, saying what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, let us now take our concerns and our joys to God in prayer. Holy God, with the dawning of a new day and a new week, we give thanks and praise We give thanks for in Christ you have shown us the way, a path of grace and peace. While we enjoy the peace you give, we know paths to wholeness are choked in the world around us by oppression. And so we pray for this world. We pray for those who are abused by another's word or strike. We pray for those who are silenced by another's hate or insecurity. We pray for those who are abandoned by another's greed or power. We give thanks for in Christ you have shown us truth. Though we know truth is undervalued in our culture, so we pray for truth and clarity in our lives. We pray for leaders who seek to make wise decisions that impact our communities. We pray for teachers who continue to share knowledge in virtual classrooms. We pray for workers who suffer and struggle, as well as for the ongoing work of caregivers, nurses and doctors, grocery workers and service providers. God, we give you thanks for in Christ you have revealed life. And so we pray that abundant life and eternal life may be known amongst your people. We pray for our church members who feel alone and isolated We pray for our friends and family who are sick or injured in body or spirit. We pray for those who grieve the loss of gatherings, celebrations, and graduations this week. Lord, share your path of mercy, truth of grace, and life of peace this week through the words and deeds of your people. We pray the words that are said aloud as well as the words lingering in the silence of our hearts with hope in Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today we worship God with gladness, celebrating God's faithfulness in all circumstances. As we show gratitude in our worship, we invite you to continue to share gifts of gratitude for the work of God through tithes and offerings. Information on how to give remotely will be shared on your screen in this service. And now, as we celebrate God's generosity and grace toward us, let us pray. God, we simply ask that the gifts that we share will be used to care for those in need while growing your kingdom's presence in this world. Amen. As this service ends and you seek Uh, to serve the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Go with God's blessing. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all persons. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. And may the blessing of Almighty God be upon you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.